there are a lot of problems that we have up here with. Uh, it's really kind of a people management problem because there's so many different parcels of land that are under, under different ownership and a lot of the, uh, you know, a few of the parcels have different management practices. And so for the public, when they come up to the parking lot, it's really important that they read the signs and really pay attention to what they say because there are areas where the dogs are supposed to be on leash or under voice command where um, they're really required to stay on the trail. And as we finish these trails, we'll be posting signs that say which trails are closed. And it's, I think a lot of people kind of filter out the signs and just walk past them. And they're, they're kind of into the, the mood of just hiking and not reading. But it's really important for the stability of some of our trails that they read the signs and stay off trails that are closed. Hi. Hey. The conflicts really come in because we have so many people that are passionate about using open space land and everybody has a slightly different interpretation of how the land should be used. And we're in a kind of a long process of trying to come up with a management plan for this area, the North Hills. And we'll be trying to address uh, all these different uses, whether it's mountain biking, hiking, or uh, you know, a place for dogs to run. And I think a lot of the comments have already been put in for those before I got on the job. But and then I think there's the whole issue of once we get a management plan in place and say there are restrictions on different types of use, then we're thrown into the arena of enforcement, which parks and rec really doesn't do. We don't have enforcement officers, uh, nor the budget really to monitor a lot of the land use. So uh, then it, you know, it just goes into another arena of the, the, the user groups policing themselves or trying to formalize it more with maybe some sort of a volunteer uh, monitoring group like the, the elk guardians who watch the elk herds in the winter to make sure they weren't being disturbed. You can see just on this road here a lot of this er erosion and the problem a lot of the trails have been really stable for years and it's partly because we don't generally receive really high intensity rainfalls and just this summer is kind of a an anomaly we've received one right after another and have really gotten a huge amount of erosion on some of the roads and a lot of the trails and that coupled with the fact that we've never really had the money to maintain our open space trails. They haven't been designed with water bars or uh, erosion dips or, or at reasonable grades. In fact, a lot of them weren't designed at all. I think a lot of the trails were, may have started off as game trails. And a lot of times those are the, the gentler trails or they started off as just small erosion gullies and then people started hiking them and then they become wide and it's really kind of hard to say what kind of, what came first but um, they've mainly been opportunistic trails without a lot of thought given as to where they've been placed or what grade and so what we're trying to do as we have time and money is close down these sections of really steep trail and redirect trails around the, the badly eroded areas that are at a more reasonable grade. And the mechanism of, of trail deterioration seems to be that what happens is it's not necessarily people going uphill that are causing the erosion. It's when people go downhill and a lot of the fine material from the uh, erosion has been washed off and so what's left are um, 
gravels that are kind of like ball bearings. And so when people are walking downhill, it's so difficult to walk on it, they step off the trail and get on new the, the bunch grasses where they can get better traction. And over the course of time, and I've seen it on Jumbo in a section of trail there in the last 10 years, it's gone from one tread to four separate treads. And that, that's one of the areas that we're working on restoring right now. And so part of our, our mission really is to educate the public about the, re, the ramifications of their actions. And if they, I think a lot of people don't think about it or they don't know the issues or we, don't, we haven't been able to sign the trails. But once we start signing the trails that are closed, uh, I hope that people will start to understand that you know, there's a reason why we're closing the trails, that uh, not only are they unsafe and uncomfortable to walk on, but we, the Parks and Rec Department, really doesn't have the budget to maintain them. And so the new trails we're putting in, we're trying to design trails that kind of maintain themselves, that the water's directed off through the design and we don't have to keep going back and cleaning uh, water bars or installing water bars. This tree just fell over. Again, this is on uh, private property. And I guess nobody drives the road, so there's no point really in taking the tree out. And it discourages anybody from maybe riding up here. OK, so this is a, um, a corner where four different parcels come together. And so at one time, I think there were historically four different property owners. And now everything to the west of this north-south property line, the city owns as far as these parcels go, uh, somewhere over uh, the ridge line. And then to the east, you can see this parcel right here is private property. And, and there's no uh, public access and there's no trespassing sign here. And this is the property we just came across the Waterworks Hill Conservation Easement, which has uh, its own set of rules. And this is the same type of sign that's posted down at the trailhead off of Duncan. And uh, it's th these different owners that kind of make it difficult to manage, uh, particularly when we're seen as really the entity that is, uh, I guess, encouraging use, but it brings a lot of land or hikers or uh, pedestrians in the vicinity of this private land where uh, they're not given permission to hike. So the other issue here, and you can see uh, this is a great spot to see the problems that we're having with our trails. If we look right here, this, I don't know if this was a trail or if it was just a, a path worn by cattle and horses moving along the fence line, which, which commonly happens. But uh, whatever started, it was eventually, I think, adopted as a pedestrian trail. And so people will leave this and hike up this path, which is incredibly steep. It must be, uh, you know, it's well over 45%. Um, in places, it may even be approaching 100%. But you can see in the last few storms, actually, this deposit of sediment that eroded from what was an old trail wasn't there two weeks ago. It was smaller, but the high intensity storms have really uh, created an unstable situation with some of these paths. And you can see up here, here's another example of what may, it may have been a, a use road for the ranch or the former property owner. So this is one of the projects that the Montana Conservation Corps will be working on later in the week. And what we're trying to do is stabilize the erosion here and then close off the trail. Uh, and you can see where people have been hiking downhill, it gets so difficult to walk that they step off the trail. And it's starting to, to show uh, multiple braids. In fact, in this place, there are four or three new trails that have started and are just in the very early stages. And so we want to close those. And we'll stabilize this part of the trail with uh, introduced fill and some biodegradable erosion control fabric that's made out of coconut fibers. All this sediment is what's washed off of that trail. And I, ideally, we'd want to transport that back up there to, to restore the trail, but we can't uh, find people with that much energy. So, so 
So this is another one of the uh, tasks that the Conservation Corps is going to take on, and it's just cleaning the water bars. Eventually, they have to ma be maintained, and they fill up with the sediment, and if it's not cleaned out, then the water just goes over the top and it isn't redirected off the trail. And so they'll be doing water bar maintenance all over the North Hills. I'm Jen Fiegels and this is my crew and we are a crew, we mainly work doing trails. It's a conservation organization, 70% of our work is trails. So we're based out of Missoula but there's also five or four other regions in Montana that work around the state. And we've been working on the Continental Divide Trail recently down in Idaho actually. A little bit in Montana, a little bit in Idaho. Um, but we're in town a little bit, and a lot of the work we do around here is um, for nonprofits, and so we don't get paid for this stuff, or the organization doesn't get paid. So where's everybody from? Um, most people in Missoula from our region have at least been here a little bit. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have graduated from UM or have lived here for a couple years, and then they decide they want to stay or come back. Um, but see. A couple of people in my correction went to high school here. So. But do you guys travel all over the place? Um, a lot of the work that the Missoula region does is actually in Idaho. So uh, mainly just because of our location and the wilderness areas around here being in Idaho. But we have a crew that's in the Bitterroots right now, and that's their whole season's in the Bitterroots with one sponsor. And then another crew's been down in Wisdom recently. And we also run a youth crew that does, I think they mainly work a lot in Welcome Creek and some other stuff. The wildlife refuge down in Bitterroots, I think. Lee Metcalf, they've been there recently. And so what are you guys doing here today? Um, we're just doing a reroute so that to control the erosion around the area. So instead of somebody coming down this trail here, which is steep and it tends to erode, we're making it less of a grade so that the trail stays nice and people can continue to walk on it. So how long do you think it'll take you? Um, we hope to finish it today. Really? Yeah. Right, finish. So you're They're quick. <laughs> okay, you're going to go from here to just to here, right? Um, or... No, it meets up with this one and then there's some flags down there too. So it's going to... I can see them. There's one by the tree right there. Or a couple oh, right in front of that tree. So you're going to go... And then there's one further down the gully. One of the things that I want to talk about is the, the role that the weed problem plays in the, a lot of our uh, land management issues. And probably 75% of the vegetation we see here is, uh, is not native vegetation. It's uh, exotic weeds that are, uh, tend to be invasive. And the primary um, broadleaf weeds are, uh, that we see here are leafy spurge, uh, spotted thistle, dalmatian toad flax. And, and, the, and so the, the problems with all this non-native vegetation is that, one, it crowds out our native plant species. And if you look at uh, historic photos, and not that far back, you know, a couple decades, you'll see that um, at times of the year it's a real luxuriant growth of uh, native forbs with a lot of uh, wildflowers and probably a higher composition of native grasses, perennial bunch grasses primarily. And so not only is that displacing native plant populations, it's probably also displacing native animal and insect populations that have evolved dependent on these uh, various local plant communities. And um, the, another effect of the non-native plants is that they, because they exclude the growth of a lot of natives, there are places where, and in fact, some of the species are thought to exclude the growth of any other plants, 
so they reduce the amount of ground cover and I think our total surface runoff is increasing because there are less there are fewer plants to intercept the raindrops and to allow infiltration in the soil or to uh, facilitate infiltration in the soil so we're getting more surface runoff and so our trails are picking up more runoff than they probably would have with the native plant community and so they're eroding faster than probably they would have if there had been no um, uh, invasive plant component. So what do you do you think they should spray? Well we do as we have, as we can afford we're spraying areas of our public open space that we can as are the ranchers uh, around um, the valley. Not everybody sprays, not every, uh, we can't afford to spray everything we have and it's not entirely uh, proven that spraying is really the most effective way to deal with it. And the, the approach the city has adopted is um, an integrated pest management approach where we're using uh, sheep to graze off areas, we're using um, beneficial or beneficial in insects, I guess, that uh, tend to prey or reduce the productivity or seed source of some of these exotic species. And uh, we've, we spray a little, and I think eventually we'll probably be using fire in, in carefully controlled conditions to address some of the weed is issues. But it's, I think it's safe to say that no one solution will take care of everything, and all the solutions still will not take care of everything. We're, we're trying to get to a point where we can control the plants and we'll, because we know we'll never eradicate all the noxious weeds. Well, the, the peace sign uh, sat here on these four uh, footings, and it was really quite tall. I think a lot of people who just saw it from town didn't realize how tall it was. It must have been 30, 40 feet tall. Was, uh, and it carried everybody's political agenda for years until they took it down. And now um, I think we're still trying to figure out what's going to happen with this, although it's been addressed in a comment in comments for the North Hills Management Plan. And there's a possibility that these will be converted into some sort of bench so people could come up here and sit. But uh, I don't think it's been decided yet.